Hello humans, welcome to this part two of our Psycho House shoot. We're in the post stage now, we're in the edit suite with JP and today we're basically going to look at how we composite all of those passes together. If you recall when we were shooting the miniature we did it all in stages, different light passes for each bit and so essentially what we're going to do now is show you how to bring all of those layers together, composite them into a final shot and then just show what, I guess what passes are useful for in terms of flexibility, right? Sure. And so you've composited this shot and all the layers within After Effects, mm -hmm. right? Uh, but that's not necessary to say that that's what you'd have to use, because essentially we're just we're layering up. So could you not use the separate layers within an NLE like Premiere, Resolve, sure. Final Cut, whatever? Yeah, yeah. It's it's the technique we used is kind of agnostic, if you like. So. Effectively, with because we're dealing with different layers and different passes, um, it's very similar to those familiar with Photoshop. So by using layers, um, we're completely bypassing it being dependent on a particular bit of software to combine. Um, they are literally stackable and editable individually, and a combination of different uh, filters or settings on those layers can give you different effects. Mm, mm, and you can tweak them all individually to create exactly the look you want to go for. A colour, a bit more colour in this light, a bit, you know, cool it off over here, all of that kind of stuff. That's that's what shooting in passes enables you to do, right? Yeah. NLEs are good for assembling a, a handful of layers like this and nowadays that actually have pretty decent inbuilt compositing features, but for more involved shots with many more layers you, you really can't beat a dedicated compositing software such as after effects nuke or, or fusion um, these give much more control over the compositing of layers and make everything fit into an effects workflow it's very similar to those that are very familiar with 3d animation mm. that might be very used to uh, through their render um, options render out separate passes right. so ambient occlusion or shadow pass or lighting pass all of those separate uh, layers uh, or passes that come from a 3d render to then get composited later this is exactly what we're doing but photographically yeah and watch this space we're going to be making these layers available uh, to our patrons on patreon as a big thank you uh, so that uh, so that you can have a play with this stuff and, and, and tweak it and play with it and, and see what kind of different looks you can come up with uh, in your chosen NLE software. So, uh, where do we begin? Clouds. Clouds. Yeah. So this is a shot from our previous shoot where we shot our fiber filled clouds in the studio. So when we wanted to do this episode, we knew that we were gonna use a cloud plate for our sky. This is the nice thing when you start shooting stuff like this, you start building up a bit of a library, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, I mean, when we were shooting the clouds themselves, we kind of knew ideally where we wanted them to fit into the shot that we were ultimately gonna use them for. So mm. that helped us inform which angle we were going to shoot at, yep. how much of the sky we would see in the background and mm. direction mm. and all that stuff. So we, we flip our plate, we shot it you know, with the, the clouds uh, on the floor, so we've sort of flipped that over, we've got our movement and you've put some, some rays in there. Did we use that in the final comp just a little bit? Yes. Like subtle? Yeah, we did. Yeah, I think it just helped add a little bit of separation with the contrast for the sky in the background. And mm. This whole kind of shot was always intended to be quite a stylized look yeah and it was great fun to do because I think going into it I think we mentioned actually in the previous episode that when you go into a shot knowing kind of what you want to get out of it was mm. always really helpful yeah so that can help in terms of composition lighting um, and just the the manner that you would photograph something can can really help if you've got a clear idea of what the end goal is yes. to start with. Yes. Yeah. So for us, we were referencing um, a, a shot or a series of shots that are in an, an existing film, for example. So that was, that was actually very helpful. But yeah. within that, we still managed to find a few options that were good to play around with. Yeah, we made it our own in yeah. certain ways. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we know what our background is in terms of using that sky plate. Yeah. So here's our first uh, our first pass. So that's a map, right? Where essentially what we've got is a silhouette of our house, blue screen yeah. lit, uh, and that's for a key, right? Yes. So it's a really good uh, benefit that we shot 
the way that we did and even at the scale that we did because for us it was very easy or very easy for you to um, light uh, for our different passes very effectively and efficiently so for us to just knock off all the lights and, and have our background colorama in our case the blue screen mm -hmm. enabled us to have a very easy way of pulling a key for our foreground miniature so as we did here for our map pass we just knocked out all lights apart from the background that gave us a very clean silhouette that we could then extract a, a match from mm -hmm. and what that does effectively is enable us to isolate the foreground perfectly so mm. that when we have our background uh, placed in we've got a nice separation there um, that we can extract the foreground from yeah 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 I think it's it's really helpful that when you're dealing with kind of tabletop miniatures which I guess this is this could be described as yeah uh, a manageable scale is that you can do things like that and you can switch up the lighting very you know, relatively quickly yeah yeah um to create these passes yeah what's so great about like you say a sort of tabletop miniature shoot is if you extrapolated this to the size of a real house yeah. just the the lights you would need the power the crew all of that and what this does is just miniaturize everything so you don't need super powerful lights mm -hmm. you can like you say switch up the the lighting setup quite quickly and you know kind of achieve something that would just cost tens of thousands to do in uh, in in one to one scale <laughs> you, you sort of mentioned photography obviously we were technically kind of rolling like at 25 a second but truth be told you don't really need to do that because it's a locked off shot we could have just taken still photographs right? That's right so you don't even need a chunky camera if you've got a decent stills camera mm -hmm. you could achieve exactly what we have done here by just taking a still. There's nothing moving in frame, the trees, the tree movement we put in after, everything is completely static, the camera is static. It would only be if we wanted to move our camera, either a, a track in or out, or, or, or kind of a, you know, maybe a move around it, then of course we'd need to shoot 25 frames or 24 or, or whatever. Exactly, and I think that's why it was nice to shoot this, this example the way that we did, because by keeping the camera static, uh, we can very easily help demonstrate that when we go through the layers, that because our camera was effectively shooting stills, if you like, mm. then it becomes very, very easy then to control those layers and choose any point in time to, to alter them. Because if, if they were having to align in space and time through a, a camera booth, unless you have a very accurate motion control uh, set up, then yeah. that can be very difficult to do. So. Yeah, well this is kind of our first uh, uh, hit out on something like this and so I think we were just keeping it simple. Also we don't have a motion control rig yet, uh, but the hope is that we will and next time we do something like this we'll put a move in there and we'll yeah. hopefully be able to demonstrate a bit of motion control and how that can bring even more life to a, to a miniature shot like this. Okay, so next pass. So this is our key light essentially, the kind of soft uh, bounced light from uh, from above and then we've got the kind of fill in there on the other side um, so just giving a little bit of uh, definition there when you're lighting something like this it's tricky it's all about finding that balance because like it's night time and 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 obviously yeah as we sort of said there's not really any lights around there so all you're getting really is the light from the sky mm. yes of course we brought a bounce in to fill up those shadows maybe you wouldn't see that in real life but then on the other hand our eyes are incredibly powerful when it comes to adapting to low light conditions and high light conditions the dynamic range of our eyes is, is generally speaking better than you'll find in a camera and so ultimately although we are introducing you know a big white board here that obviously wouldn't be there in real life what we're doing is making it easier to see as our eyes would in those conditions and having that extra information as well you can always knock that back, you know, yeah. you can go back from, from that apparent added exposure. But having that information there to start with is always a benefit. Yeah. Now might be a good time to remind you that it really helps us if you subscribe to our channel. Uh, give us a like on the video if you're enjoying it. We're on various social channels. You can find us there and help stay updated with, with what we're up to and when we're dropping episodes. Uh, next up, we've got our lightning flashes. You made a really great point about checking if you're using a digital projector you need to make sure that your frame rate is set correctly yeah just to double check through recording a short clip and playing back because the live preview that you could have on on your monitor could look fine oh really it's only when you 
you play back what you've recorded, you then sometimes tell that there's flicker. You'll see something you didn't when you were just checking yeah. the live view. That's really good to know. Because sometimes it, it can fall in, in the area of syncing with the refresh rate of your monitor or the refresh rate of your LCD display on your camera and you're not necessarily seeing a flicker or a, a strobing effect happen right. on your recording. And That's really only on playback that you, you should be able to see yeah. if any issues have, have been recorded. Gotcha. And it's usually the case that if we drop the shutter speed of the camera lower than normal and that what that enables us to do is to almost get clear of, of the clash of, of the, the frequency refresh rate or hertz of the projector that we were using mm. so there's less chance of it colliding with a, a similar but not quite locked yeah. uh, refresh rate. In our case that was a, a kind of benefit as well because it gave us a bit more exposure but again it's very wise to kind of do as much testing as you can if you're going to primarily use a video projector as a light source or a background image. Yeah because it can be really subtle can't it? Yeah, it can be it can be an obvious kind of flicker strobe, or it can be a very slow, gradual mm. ripple effect that you get over time. Mm. So then we shot our window reflection pass. If I actually speed up this this plate, you can actually see the shadow change over the face of the model itself. So you can see the clouds it's, moving. It's a very subtle effect, but what it's actually doing is it's the projected light source is moving across that board as a bounce, effectively. Mm is actually generating a soft moving shadow. And again, a lot of these passes have, can be quite subtle and they can be dialed up and down because they are individual layers. But once they're all added together cumulatively, um, they can give a, a, a very realistic result that you might not consciously know what's going on, but it, all those little added details can add up to a really, um, nice looking effect. Mm. And then we've got our window spill. We just use a little RGB LED uh, brick there set to tungsten. We were lucky with our model because there was enough physical space in it to actually rig a, yeah. a small light. Yeah. Um, now that kind of LED technology is so small and bright, it's, it's very easy now that even if we had a very, very small space behind there, we could have rigged something yeah. of equal power. And again, because this is shot at a separate uh, pass if you like this enables us to turn on and off at will yeah um, yeah because we didn't do that live no the the light switching on that's a post like a, a quick fade i suppose yeah i mean it's literally a case of turning on and off one layer mm. but having them as a separate element that can be overlaid over everything else just gives that extra bit of flexibility because we can also impart different Color temperatures or, or hues and things like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, little party going on in, uh, party in there. Yeah, just having them as a separate element is uh, is very handy to have. Mm. Obviously, the lightning came in um, on one of the flashes, and I was like, "Ooh, ooh, how, how did how, <laughs> what happened? How did we get that? Was this stock footage or did you shoot this?" Uh, this is from my garden. Um, I think last year we had a mad electrical storm oh i remember actually it, it was quite silent and it was just loads of mad electrical activity happening yes, in the sky yes um with some wonderful colors and i just grabbed whatever camera i had to hand and just grabbed a couple of seconds of lightning as it came straight overhead that's such a good capture there um, good work and you never know when things like that become handy for future either reference or for direct use of an element yeah because you didn't shoot that for this no like no, no one's going to wait around for a lightning bulb like, yeah i can't i can't finish the shot yet because i need to film some lightning so we'll just we'll just hang around and wait for that to happen. yeah right it's like <laughs> if, if an event like this happens go out there and shoot it if you can yes totally and ideally on a on a good quality camera but mm. i mean uh, the resolution of phones now you know the the cameras on phones are very good is this a DSLR or something you used here? Yeah, this yeah. is my 5D Mark III. But right. It could have been on my phone. Yeah. The, uh, the kind of. And actually, I, I haven't really filmed lightning before. I haven't done much sort of weather stuff. Are there any particular settings you need to be aware of when getting lightning? Because lightning can cause banding and yes, things like it can. that, can't it? In fact, this clip has some examples of that. Um, right. 
because it's so fast. It's very similar to what we were referring to with the projector. Mm. Um, with rolling shutter that a lot of or all CMOS based cameras have, which are, are the majority of cameras that people have access to mm. readily, um, you encounter a phenomena of rolling shutter. So that's where the shutter gets read either top down or down to top. Yeah. And there's a slight latency in that. So if you have a very, very fast flash or a very, very fast exposure event, mm. then you can sometimes have half the, the frame or a quarter of the frame brighter than the other yeah. part. And that's because it's basically to take an image, it scans top to bottom or bottom to top. Yeah. And it's basically the exposure is happening too fast yes. for that camera to get it in time. Yeah, correct. So a camera that would have a global shutter mm. would be able to take one image at a time in its entirety. So um, traditional movie cameras yep. that shoot film and higher end digital cinema cameras may have a global shutter yeah. um, that can capture very, very fast frequency flashes a lot better because they, they will take a full frame image of that flash rather than perhaps catch halfway through a capture of the shutter, yeah. if you know what I mean. Yeah. Actually, on automatic exposure phones or settings like that, it's very, very tricky to get a clean image. Mm. So if you are using a phone, a uh, mobile phone to capture footage for elements, for example, there's some really good apps out there. Mm. But there's a really good app that I use called Filmic Pro, uh, which enables you to override a lot of the automatic functions yes. that would normally be on your camera phone. Um, and that that can help a lot, help set custom exposures and yeah. focus and things like that. Any tools like that that you can have in your pocket at all times can be a great benefit when, yeah. especially environmental kind of events that you wouldn't necessarily expect to be ready there with be the ready camera for. and all the stuff. And things like elements, it's it's surprising how resolution sometimes doesn't matter that much. Because mm. something like a, a lightning bolt or a tree being blowing in a certain way in, in the wind, you know, you may only want to shrink down to a tiny size anyway in your yep. composition. And just lots of things that you can spot in nature if you get in the habit of documenting and cataloging just on a hard drive you know forget about it and you never know mm. there will be a day where it'll come in handy where you'll thank yourself or kick yourself <laughs> depending on whether you shut it or not because there's a lot of great stuff stock footage out there but sometimes it's really hard to find the right thing and mm. if you film something yourself you tend to remember it that's so better. true that's <laughs> so true and you tend to remember where it was and what the actual lighting was and what where the actual event took place yeah nicely done ah uh, yes so talking of elements <laughs> <laughs> the leaves the leaves which were a good idea yeah but we didn't end up using so this is another again very useful technique to know actually so you can shoot elements like this something small something that can you can control either within a studio or even in your bedroom or back room that can be fed into a particle system, a 2D particle system. And effectively, the advantage of that enables you to separate your footage and place it within a 2D space and replicate it many, many times. So one or two leaves becomes thousands, potentially. Yeah, that's right. And it wasn't until fairly late in the stage that I realized that once <laughs> our leaf elements uh, elements were shrunk down they didn't quite register the movement as we'd like because the, the whole trees in and of themselves aren't taking up a huge amount of space right. <laughs> in the shot exactly yeah and they just got, kind of got lost in the in the detail but mm. so again back to the backyard <laughs> there was a uh, overgrown tree at the back of uh, back of my garden it's like a silver birch i would say i think it is yeah they, they look quite similar to our trees yeah say. and on an uh, overcast day it was very easy to take that bright background and do a luma key extraction mm. i could have waited for a perfect blue sky sure but here in the uk <laughs> could be waiting a while could be waiting a long time mm. and what's lovely as well is that obviously rather than just adding leaves to a static tree we've actually got some branch movement there as well i think it's a, a strong enough storm that it wouldn't just be shimmering in the leaves so in some respects it is the kind of the, the better way to do it and that's the other thing as well is how 
like I say, the trees aren't taking up a huge amount of space in the shot, but if they were completely static, it's the kind of thing that might draw the eye as being right. n just not right. Yes, because you, you look at the, the shot as a whole and you think, okay, well, the, the, the storm clouds seem to be moving fairly fast. Yeah. Is, is the wind, therefore, not coming down to the ground level or is it in between or is it mm. you know and the last thing you want is for someone to be asking those questions <laughs> yeah i mean when they're the, looking at this that's not there's not about the trees but yeah exactly i mean even subconsciously you can look at the picture as a whole and think mm, maybe there's something not quite right happening mm. there but the idea is is to see just the, enough visual cues that um the audience can hopefully buy. Yeah, it's just something happening in the periphery that feels right, so you don't need to look at it. Because really our focus is the house, the window, Norman in the foreground. The last thing you want is for someone to suddenly go, uh, why are those trees moving? Yeah. <laughs> so on to Mother. Ah, uh, yes. So a couple of live action elements in the final shot. The window's very, very small. If we're, we're looking at this full screen and you can sort of quite clearly see Pete's beard there. We could just argue, you know, it's been a while. Mother's not getting a lot of action these days and she's let herself go. But once you put it right back, you know, into such a small part of the shop, that sort of thing is noticeable. Mm. And so for this, of course, we needed, because it's a low angle shot, we needed a nice tall uh, green screen, just literally the tallest stands we had. Triple Rise has got us about 20 foot high or thereabouts. And then, yeah, boxing her in to get that nice, that nice clean silhouette. So this was that green screen element of uh, Pete extracted and dropped in to our window light pass. One thing I did add here was the shadow. Yeah, yeah so now obviously that is a, a post edition there. Yeah. But by the look of it, you are using the silhouette as your basis for the shadow, right? That's right. So I composited the shot in After Effects, and within that, there's a couple of plugins that you can get as third party that will help you generate shadows from your keyed material. Mm -hmm. um, effectively, all that does is take a copy of that layer and uh, allows you to distort or project it onto a 2D plane uh, to give the impression that it's a, a cast shadow. Mm. The, the example that we have in our shot, I, I just did it manually. So I, I duplicated that silhouette shot and yeah. just with a corner pin effect allowed me to distort it to approximately match the perspective of the building uh, where the light was being cast. Yeah, it's maybe an interesting point to make, which is to say, where that shadow is happening, if the room was lit, say, from a single bulb up in the ceiling, that's not necessarily where that shadow would be firing. Um, but it's, it's finding that balance between what is real or accurate and what looks good. Or yeah. if, it was, if, it, if the shadow was absent there, people might ask questions. Exactly. I think if the light was technically behind her in the middle of the room, you may not see any cast shadow mm. from that p particular angle, but there's a bit of artistic license. Again, we're going for quite a stylized thing, so yeah. any, <laughs> any little cues that we can add to the shot that gives a bit more interaction between the layers, yeah. we could suppose that it's a lamp from the corner. Totally saying there's a lamp in the corner there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Casting Over the shadow. The shadow. <laughs> so on to your Academy Award winning. <laughs> uh, Pass. Look at that, look at that stance. Strong. <laughs> Strong. Strong. And I think the way you, because I wasn't there the day that you shot this, I think what was really good is that you replicated the the angle, you know, the, the supposed uh, geography, if you like, of the shot where we're looking at this building at the top of a hill, you're, you're coming up from the bottom of that hill and the camera is supposedly, I guess, quite low down, mm. looking up. Yeah which helps with the composition. But I think if, we, if you had shot your element of you walking into frame just flat, it, it, it really wouldn't have had the same. Even though it's a silhouette, you would absolutely yeah. know that something's not right yeah. there. So There's a yeah. mismatch with it. Yeah, exactly. And it varies what level of, uh, of, of detail you have to go to in terms of synchronizing camera angles and things like that for separate elements. Um, but in this case, I did, we didn't take measurements of what angle the camera is at, but obviously you're, you'd also have to then extrapolate that in terms of scale 
Um, and so really it was just kind of feeling, well, we know we're, you know, to the left, low angle, looking up, let's mimic that as best we can, uh, and then dropping it in should, should fit pretty well. And I think, I think we could have, if we had shot it at, at a higher level, we could have um, taken that layer and distorted it in perspective in post, but mm. I think there's only so much you can do that where it looks exactly like that, but you've, you've, you've taken a flat plane and you've, you're cheating the perspective. Yeah, um, and you can start to tell if, if an image is getting warped, particularly if it's something real, like a human, yeah. something recognisable walking around. I mean, of course, there's other things that we could have done to, to further sell it. You know, we could have had the, uh, the projection flashes hitting me as I walk up. Um, we would absolutely be locking ourselves in in terms of timing sure, if yeah. we did that. But again, like, I think it's something that we, we try to sort of point out every now and again with, with these things is that we're, we're, we're demonstrating what's possible here, right? If we had a budget to do this for a feature film, of course there's things we'd do, not necessarily differently, but we'd go that extra mile. Um, uh, and there's things like that that you could further, further add to, to further sell it. But really it was just like, well, we could stick this in, we could try that, you know, what if you do this? And I think that's good to mention, isn't it, for a lot of our videos, is that we're, we're very keen to start the ball rolling in people's minds, perhaps, as yes. to what is possible um, with things that they may have to hand or a space that they might have to hand to film something in. Yes, we're hopefully doing as good as we can, you know, in terms of demonstrating ideas and, and techniques, but um, there's definitely a keenness from us to see more people take techniques like this and um, run with them, Yeah, really push them. Absolutely, I mean, of course, you know, we used, you know, a fair few big bits of kit and stuff to do this, um, but essentially we're just using what we have available. Um, we didn't hire anything in for this. We're very lucky to have, uh, you know, a lot of useful bits of kit lying around. Um, but ultimately, you don't necessarily need to have all of that stuff. We simply used it because it was available. You wouldn't necessarily need to have something on a boom that you can articulate and all of that kind of stuff. Essentially, I think when you really break it down into what was used here, it's all fairly small and it's all relatively simple stuff. Mm. The only thing I did add um, on top of what we mentioned was um, just a subtle mist effect, which is... Yes, I clocked that which is just behind your layer and in front of a house layer. And that's just to give quite a subtle lift in contrast between uh, you and the house, just to give a very subtle impression of distance and mm. uh, separation. Yeah, nice. And then we've got that little post move in the end. So obviously we shot 69. Yeah. Then the nice thing with adding a, a, a kind of 235 or 239 crop afterwards means that you've then got a little bit of wiggle room on the vertical to then create a little a little tilt up in post. Sure, and I think it goes back to the original discussion about tone and mm. composition and how you might want a single shot to to work for you in, in terms of where it features in the story. So if it's an establishing shot or a shot that establishes a tone or uh, a geographical setting, sometimes a tilt can help you do that because it will gradually draw the eye to the area of interest. That's it. It's using camera movement to draw the eye. It's, it's an introduction, isn't it? But it's also kind of looking up at this big thing that we should be a little bit frightened of as well. Yeah. And I think that's, that's, that's a really important point to make is how camera movement can, can just change. Yeah, it, it can change the way you see a shot in so many ways, whether it is drawing the eye or whether it's actually creating a feeling within you. I think, and that comes with experience, you know, when you, when you start out lighting, whether it's miniatures or, or live action, um, you know, at first you're just learning what looks good, you know, and that's how a lot of people will start is just, well, you know, well, if it's soft and it's over here and all backlight always looks nice and things like that. But then once you get past, okay, I know how to make things look good. Mm -hmm. Once you get past that, you start to really kind of break down what's going on, you know, and what do we want people to feel? And ultimately, you know, you want you want emotion in cinematography. You know, how, how lighting or camera movement can create feelings, can draw the eye, can create a sense of tone. Um, and it's just, it's about serving the story ultimately, isn't it? It's not just yeah. technicalities. 
And I think, I think that's worth mentioning is that effect shots can do that too. They can often work best when they're, they work in partnership uh, or in marriage of the storytelling process. You know, it's, it's another tool to be used in, in that way where at their best they can help push the story or, or, or plot points or help set a tone and all those mm. things. And what's nice even with our, you know, relatively basic demonstration mm. is that you can kind of see how you can do that. You can plan and plot a shot composition, what you want it to say mm. visually in mm. a way. So whether that be part, in our case, of a, being both a, a establishing shot and also a, a, a tone setting shot yeah. as well. Yeah. A foreboding kind of dark, sinister kind of feel to the whole thing. Yeah. And, and how much you can do in one shot or a, seri a sequence of shots maybe yeah. where you can help not Further just that. not just establish the geography with a with a with an establishing shot. You can do more than that. I'm so chuffed with it, man. I mean, seriously, like that's that that that's a foot tall that house. Uh, <laughs> uh, with coffee stirrers. With coffee stirrers. Um, you know, I mean, obviously, yeah. Like we say, this this is kind of for demonstration purposes. You know, there's things I'd look at there and be like, oh well. The window frames, for example, yeah. like are, you know, they're, they're too kind of chunky and whatever. But I mean, that's not really the point we're trying to make here. We're, what we're trying to show is is what's possible with, with relatively little, really. And, and, and as a, the point I made in the episode that is, you know, the most important starting point with, with a miniature shoot is the miniature. And the more work you put into that, uh, the, the, the better. Um, and, and, you know, it is sometimes you'll think, oh, that looks so good. And then when it's, it's when you really, it's when you start scrutinizing it on a monitor, that's when you start really picking it apart. Mm -hmm. uh, and that goes back to your thing about testing and, you know, shoot a bit, have a look at it, put it onto your monitor, check it out and be like, oh, actually, do you know what? I thought that was okay, but this needs more work. Well, so that, uh, that brings us to the end of our little uh, psycho miniature post chat. Um, we hope you got something out of it. Uh, if you were looking for something a little more technical, consider signing up to our Patreon, uh, where we're going to be generally getting a bit more in-depth with some of the technical post stuff, um, which we'll be putting out uh, on there. So it just leaves us to say thanks for watching. Don't forget to uh, subscribe to the channel. Like this video if you've got something out of it. We're on Twitter. We're on various social business. Go and find us on there if, uh, if you're into that sort of thing. Huge thanks to our patrons on Patreon. We hope to be bringing lots of exclusive content for you uh, to say a big thank you for uh, helping us out. Uh, I think that just remains for, um, for us to say adios and uh, here's Pete and his moves to see us out.